Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce today uh, Yarin. Um, he's going to be giving a talk on his uh, recent research on uh, combining two very uh, powerful and popular paradigms in machine learning, uh, Bayesian inference and uh, deep learning. Um, thank you very much. Um, thank you for inviting me. So yeah, we're going to talk about modern deep learning for Bayesian eyes. So, let me start. I'm not going to assume that the audience is going to be expert in deep learning or in Bayesian modeling, because these are very separate fields. So I'm going to give uh, a nice introduction, at least, for both of these fields, but not spend too much on this, just for you not to get too bored. So in modern deep learning, we work with conceptually simple models. Basically, you take a vector x transform that by matrix W, squash it from some linearity, and continue again and again. And with these simple building blocks, we can combine, we can, we can build complex, very complex models. And I think it's this conceptual simplicity that managed to attract so much attention from the public media, it managed to capture the, uh, the, basically the, the public's eye. And the field has fundamentally changed the way machine learning is used in industry. Over the past couple of years, the field has been driven by pragmatic developments of tractable models that work well and scale well. But the field has also been pushed forward mostly by practitioners, and many more theoretical questions were left unanswered. For example, why does my model work? we don't understand many of the tools that we use. If you look at stochastic regularization techniques like dropout or multiplicative Gaussian yeah. noise, these are used in most of modern deep learning as a way to avoid overfitting, as a way to improve performance. Why do they make sense? Why would they do any of that? Or you could ask, what does my model know? We can't really tell whether our models are certain or not about their predictions. If you give me the CO2 levels in Mauna Loa, Hawaii, over the past 50 years, and I were to normalize it and center that, and then if you were to ask me, what's going to be the CO2 level in 20 years' time? I can fit a model to that. It will give me this prediction. I don't think that's going to be the CO2 level in 20 years' time. But I can't really tell from the model whether the model is certain about that prediction or not. Last question is, why does my model predict this and not that? Basically, our models are black boxes and not, inter not that interpretable. And if you work in medicine, if you work in physics, in biology, you need to understand why your model predicts a certain output. A physician would rather use a decision tree that is more interpretable, where you can actually understand each step of, de of the decision-making process than use, for example, a black box. Perhaps surprisingly, or maybe not, given the title of the talk, we can answer or this attempt to answer these questions using Bayesian modeling. And over the next 40, 45 minutes, we're going to try to answer these three questions. Why does my model work? What does my model know? And discuss why does my model predict this and not that and other open problems. Understanding why our models work actually has some really important implications into the way that we use these tools, developing new tools, better tools. But before we can talk about that, we need to talk about Bayesian modeling and how that relates to deep learning. Bayesian modeling is very simple. I think most of the people in the audience should know that, should know the basics at least. So I'm not going to spend too much time on that, but still, just to get the basics, so everyone is on even plane, even ground. In Bayesian modeling, we assume that you have observed x and the input x and corresponding outputs y. 
And we assume that there exists some stochastic process that generated our outputs, given the inputs. And our task is to capture these stochastic process. For that, we're going to define a model. We're going to make the model variables, model parameters into random variables, and put a prior distribution over this, basically how do we believe these variables behave before we observe any data. And then we're going to define a likelihood. If you give me a certain model parameter, setting for the model parameters and some inputs, what are the more likely and less likely outputs for these inputs? With these two components, we can find the posterior. Basically, given an entire data set, what are the most likely value, uh, parameters for the model? And then we can take that posterior and make predictions. Integ if you give me a new point, x star, I can integrate the likelihood of that x star with respect to the posterior to find the probabilities for the different outputs. The issue is that, the main issue is that this posterior is often intractable, basically for most of the models that we care about in practice. So what we do, we're going to do instead, we're going to approximate the posterior with a simple distribution Q over the same over the same random variables, parameterized by theta. We're going to minimize the Kullback library, the KL divergence between Q and P. There's Q and that's P. So we're going to wiggle the parameters for Q more and more and more until we manage to get a good fit between the two distributions. That's equivalent to minimizing this objective. That's just the negative elbow, where the minimizing the first term encourages Q to explain the data well. That's just integrating the likelihood, the log likelihood with respect to Q. Minimizing the second term encourages Q to keep close to the prior distribution. And then we can just swap the, uh, the posterior with the approximate posterior and perform predictions through that. Now, what does that have to do with deep learning? We're going to talk about dropout specifically for now and later on about other techniques as well. Dropout is used in most of modern deep learning tools, most of modern models. It works very simply by just, you take your input vector x at training time, you randomly set elements of that vector to zero. So you have a vector, which is the input, and with probability half, for example, you set each element in that vector to zero, multiply that by w, squash it through some linearity, and then again, randomly set elements in that intermediate vector to zero. And then you repeat that again and again. At test time, what you do, so at this time you would take the input x, multiply that by w times half without actually chopping out anything, and then squash it and then continue again and again. Doing that procedure somehow circumvents overfitting and somehow improves performance. We can attempt to explain why using Bayesian statistics, using Bayesian modeling. For that we need to talk about Bayesian neural networks. These are very simple models. You simply take a neural network and put a distribution over the weights. So we're going to put a prior distribution over the weights of the network. For example, normal 0, 1. And collect all of these Ws to be our model parameters, omega, that we talked about a second ago. Just as a side comment, if we increase the number of units in our Bayesian neural network, more and more and more, then in the limit, you actually would converge to the Gaussian process. And that has some really important implications to understanding our models. We're going to talk about that. I'm going to mention that again later. OK, so if Ws are random variables, that means that the model output is also, a random, uh, is also random, which means that we can define our likelihood, for example, if we want to do classification by just squashing that output through a softmax. What does that mean? Um, just a softmax is a function that takes a scalar value, uh, well, a vector value, and then just gives you probabilities, a probability vector output. Wait, so the input of softmax is a vector? Yeah. Or a vector, a vector of distributions or a vector of scalars? Um, it's a <coughs> vector of scalars. OK, so softmax takes a vector of scalars and it produces one number? It squashes that into a probability vector. So the output of that will sum to one. The, out, the, out, the output of that is a vector where the sum of the elements will be one. OK, so it 
takes a vector and produces a probability distribution. What, yeah, I, yeah. I still don't have a sense of what it does. That, that basically, that's what it does. It just squashes that so the sum of the elements will sum to one. Perhaps you could say squash like exponentiates or raised to a power or something. Okay, maybe, yeah. Um, the, I can't remember. Uh, it's going to be. Yeah. So that's going to be proportional to the exponent of the minus, 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 yeah, the minus input, minus f in that case. And then you just normalize by the sum over all the possible uh, elements. But that's, in, in, that's for classification. For regression, it's actually much easier. You just add some, uh, observe, you corrupt that network output with some observation noise. Uh, by just passing that for, as a mean of a normal distribution. And then you can use that likelihood for regression. So we have either likelihood for classification or likelihood for regression, depends on what setting you have. We have a prior, we have a likelihood, we need to talk about the posterior. But the posterior in this case is very difficult to evaluate, and many have tried. This is a tiny subset of uh, literature that I collected that as part of um, some digging into the history of the idea of Bayesian neural networks. Uh, I did as part of a blog post. Um, the earliest references that I could find to this idea were from 1987 by Hofield. These were extended by, extended by Denker and Jan Likun in 91, David McKay in 92, uh, Hinton and Van Kamp in 93, Hartford Tilly in 95, uh, David Barber and Chris Bishop in 98. And some of these, I think uh, Radford Neal's model was actually considered state of the art for many years. Um, alas, it didn't scale and it was forgotten. But we, recently we had a resurrection in these ideas in works like Alex Graves from 2011, Charles Blunden and others 2015, Miguel Hernandez Lobato and Ryan Adams from 2015 as well. And some of these actually use variational inference. So I think Alex and Hindel van Kamp basically use variational inference, but still, none of these really stuck. When you open up, when you go outside and, I don't know, look for papers on deep learning, you don't see anyone talking about Bayesian neural networks. And when you read news articles about people use deep, deep learning to do blah and blah and blah, no one, no one really uses these. Uh, just as a side comment, we'll get back to these two later. So why should we care about this if no one uses this? Well, it turns out that most of modern deep learning, most of modern tools in deep learning, have been doing approximate inference in Bayesian neural networks. They've been developed empirically, step by step, just getting tiny improvements every time, and inadvertently just converging to mathematically equivalent of performing inference, approximate inference, in Bayesian neural networks. I think that's quite a good result. Let's see why. So we're going to go from the other side. We're going to develop approximate inference in our Bayesian neural network and see what we get from that. So for that, we need to define Q to approximate our posterior omega given x and y. We're going to talk about Q itself in a second. If you give me Q, I need to minimize this divergence, this objective, which is a pain. Doing log likelihood for likelihood, the sort of stuff that we talked about a second ago over a network output, is not going to be tractable for almost all Qs that you can think of. So instead, what we're going to do, we're going to approximate that quantity with Monte Carlo integration. We're going to sample omega from Q look at log likelihood that that omega hat, that's going, to be, that's going to give us a new objective, L hat. Now, this L hat is an unbiased estimator to L. If you take the expectation of L hat with respect to Q, then you can actually see quite easily, you just integrate that respect to Q, and just get that back. So we have an unbiased estimator. Now, using some results in stochastic approximate inference, we know that optimizing L hat will converge to the same optima as optimizing L. With theta, the parameters have to explain L hat best. 
are the same parameters that explain L. What that means is that, is that to do approximate inference, to do inference, what we need to do is sample omega hat from Q and do one step of minimization to this objective. Now let's talk about Q. If we're gonna, we're gonna define Q, so remember omega is a set of all random variables, a set of all matrices, linear transformations. We're gonna define Q to factorize over Ws. And for each W, we're gonna define Q to be just mean matrix M, which is a rational parameter, times A diagonal, where we're gonna put Bernoulli's over the diagonal. So we're gonna define that to be A random matrix, where Q, the distribution for Q is defined by this random variable. So, in summary, Excuse me. yes. So the objective function depends on theta only in the second term. The objection function actually depends on theta over here, but also on theta over here through omega sampled from Q. But so in the second step, W hat is fixed, right? When you minimize with respect to theta. No, no, no. So that's actually very important. You, you, I'm, I'm skipping a couple of very important points over here just because of the time constraints. But in actually, what you would want to do is reparameterize Q to get theta into this objective, so we can just sample omega from an actual statistic, basically without depending on any parameters, and then you can differentiate that very easily. But you can imagine that, for simplicity, just being a normal centered at theta and some deviation one, just conceptually. And then sampling omega from that is gonna be basically sample normal zero, zero one plus that <coughs> parameter theta, and then Putting that over here would be theta over here, plus that epsilon from normal zero one, and that's the dependence on theta for the first term. Yeah, that's a very good question because often that is something that is actually not that obvious from over here. So this is basically sort of normal zero one over here. We have m times diagonal of Bernoulli's. So in summary in order to do approximate inference in our model, we're gonna sample Z from Bernoulli's, multiply our mean matrices M by diagonals, diagonal Bernoulli's, collect these to be our the set of variables, and then just do one step of minimization for this objective. Now, sampling this Z is identical to randomly setting columns of M to zero which is identical to just randomly setting units of the network to zero. And that should look quite familiar because that is exactly dropout. What we have over here, this is our objective. This is identical to the loss. The negative log likelihood is identical to the loss that you would do usually in deep learning for regression, for classification, Euclidean loss, uh, softmax loss. And this term can be approximated very tightly using L2 regularization, at least for normal 0, 1 pi over P. That's important to note. And I think once one important point to mention about this is that something that I got some questions about at previous talks that I guess sometimes is not communicated that well, is that if I were to sit down and implement this inference algorithm, I will be implementing line to line dropout. I will just be implementing this. Code wise, it's exactly the same. Mathematics says that it's exactly the same. Now, what we can do with that, we can, yes? So, the, the measure you construct for Q is a mixed measure, right? You have a, a certain probability that certain elements of, of, of the weight vector will be exactly zero, right? So, how is the KL divergence defined in this case? That's a very good question. It has a very long answer. I'm going to answer that at the end of the talk because otherwise it's going to get too sidetracked. So remember that. Remember this question. Um, so what can we do with this? First of all, we can answer why does dropout work? If you were to go out today and just ask some random person in the street, why do they think dropout works? They would say, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> but if you were to go out and ask some random person in the street that does deep learning, why do you think dropout works? And you're actually quite likely to find some random person in the street doing deep learning these days. <laughs> they, say, they might say because it adds noise. Or they might say the dropout paper 
motivates this technique by a metaphor to sexual reproduction. I think a more reasonable explanation is that dropout works because it approximately integrates over the model parameters, basically what we do in Bayesian inference day to day. That means that the noise is a side effect of the approximate integration. Dropout doesn't work because of the noise. It works despite of the noise that we add. This might also explain model over specification. If you notice in the field in deep learning recently, people have started using larger and larger models since the introduction of these stochastic regularization techniques. And models which are way more complex than the signal that actually you're trying to capture, they, the approach that you would take is usually, I'm going to use as large as a model as I can fit on my GPU. And this might be some way of approximating a non-parametric approach, in this case, a Bayesian non-parametric approach, because you capture, you have an overly complicated model where you just integrate over all the parameters that you don't care about to adaptively capture different signal complexities. Basically, you're defining, you're approximating a non-parametric model by doing a cutoff <laughs> for huge K with the K, the approximation, and then just integrate over the stuff that you don't care about. And lastly, the most important point is that basically means that using dropout, we basically fit to the process that generated our data. So instead of just connecting the dots for given a data set, we actually fit a distribution. We fit to the distribution that generated our data set. Now, if you, you do actually use dropout, then there are some interesting very interesting questions about why specifically this Q structure. So some questions that I got were about this work were basically, oh, it looks like you just defined Q in order to get dropout. Yes, I defined Q in order to get dropout. Now that we have a mathematical object that we can study, we can ask what are the properties of this Q? What are the properties of this specific structure? And then start understanding some of the properties of dropout. For example, we know that many Bernoulli's are a cheap way to get multimodality, or that dropout at test time can simply be approximated by propagating the mean of the matrices. So remember what I said before about just taking the matrix times half at test time? That's just taking the mean of our approximating distribution. More interesting is that the structure that this Q imposes. This Q imposes strong correlation. So if you look at the spectral decomposition of the function that you're trying to capture, then this Q basically imposes strong correlations between the function frequencies, independent, of course, the output dimensions. And I think much more interesting, this Q structure actually constrains the weights to lie near the origin. We know that in Bayesian modeling, we know that the posterior uncertainty will decrease as we see more and more data. Our posterior for HW is just M, M transpose P minus P squared. P is the dropout probability, M is the mean of our weight matrix. For fixed P, in order for the optimizer to decrease posterior uncertainty, we have to decrease the magnitude of M. And this actually has some really good, exp that actually explains why does dropout actually perform well as, an, as a regularizer? Because if we have small magnitude for M, for M, then we have low frequencies. Basically, we only have low magnitude weights. We, have, we can only use low frequencies, so we can only capture smooth functions or smoother functions. Uh, also interesting, smallest M is obtained when we have the strongest regularization as at P equals 0.5, the largest dropout regularization gets, is obtained at 0.5, which is also seen empirically in the dropout paper. So these are some interesting insights, but I will get back to this actually at the end of the talk as possible in possible application for future research. Uh, before that, can we actually explain other, other stochastic regularization techniques using this framework? Yeah, we can explain, for example, multiplicative Gaussian noise. So MGN, works simply by multiplying network units by normal one to one. Mm -hmm. And somehow that gives you the same performance as just doing dropout. Now, there are some explanations for dropout as sparse regularization, which none of these really generalize to this case. 
However, if you look at that as an approximate inference, then this is just a different approximating distribution. You put normal 1, 1 over the diagonal. This Q structure has many of the properties of the other Q for the dropout case that we talked about before. And you can get different similar results for drop connect and other stochastic techniques. Basically techniques that you use, I think that most techniques where you use some stochastic element during optimization can be seen often as related to these ideas. Cool, so we talked about some theoretical insights into what's going on. That's some very nice quote that I found online. Theory is worth nothing if it can't be used to make better code. In the sense that if you have a theory, then you might, I mean, what's a, what's a, how much does a theory worth if you can't make predictions and try to validate it or disprove it? I'm going to show you some results of using these ideas to make better use of the current tools that we have, developing new tools. We can also use these results to understand model structure selection. So that's what I talked about Gaussian processes before. Um, we can use Bayesian statistics literature to understand why do we use different model architectures. We're not going to have enough time to talk about that, but we're going to talk about how we can use dropout in different models like convolutional neural networks. So these models are used for image processing. And they're gaining more and more attention in, uh, in the vision community. Uh, Quantnet or convolutional neural network. This is an example of a model, Lenet structure. Works by doing convolutions followed by some pooling layers. We're going to ignore the pooling. Followed by normal linear transformations at the end. A convolution is simply a 3D linear transformation. So linear transformation, we have a matrix W multiplied by some input vector. Convolution is going to be 3D tensor convolved with some patch from the image. So that's basically going to preserve our structure. And that can actually be reduced to a linear operation. So we know that these are very similar in nature to these. In the field, we usually work with huge models, millions and millions of parameters. And these overfit very, very quickly. And we need some way to do regularization. Obviously, you would want to do dropout in this. Dropout is a very cheap way to do regularization. How do we do dropout? Well, if you look at papers in the field, we do dropout over the linear transformations at the end. We don't do dropout over the convolutions. And I asked, why do we not do dropout over convolutions? And some answers that I got is that we try that. It doesn't work, so we don't do that, which is a fair answer. It doesn't give us too much insight into what's going on or how we can build better models. Another answers, other answers that I got is that we have low code adaptation, so we don't need to do con dropout in convolutions. I think that we don't do dropout in convolutions because we don't use that correctly. So what I mentioned before, currently when you do dropout at test time, you would just take half of the weights and just do a normal deterministic pass through the network without actually dropping out anything. But if you look at that as a stochastic, as a Bayesian model, you would want to approximate the predictive distribution. You can approximate the predictive mean by just doing Monte Carlo integration, again, sampling omega from our approximating distribution and just averaging that multiple times. In practice, what that means is that we simply need to average stochastic forward passes through the network, i.e. do dropout at test time and average the results. That means that doing dropout after convolutions as well as the end of the network, and then just averaging forward passes through the network is identical to doing approximate inference in a Bayesian convolutional in a Bayesian convolutional neural network. So over here, I have some example results. MNIST, it's a benchmarking data set where we need to classify digits to 10 different classes. I have the standard model, Lynette, that we saw the, in the picture before, without any dropout at all. And for that, we get about 0.95. Now, doing dropout at the end of the model, the way that it is used today in the field, we get a huge improvement to about 0.75. If we do dropout over the convolutions as well, but 
evaluate that at test time using the existing techniques in the field. Techniques that people say we don't do that because it fails. You can see the dashed blue line. It does indeed fail. We actually get worse results. But taking the same network, the same model, the same parameters, just at test time evaluating the same model by averaging stochastic passes for the model, we get these huge improvements again, 0.55, I think. Now, this demonstrates nicely these ideas where these are the sort of results that we got before dropout. And with the empirical development of new regularization techniques, we managed to get this much improvement. And by understanding why we do what we do, we can again, again, gain huge a huge gain in improvement. Um, we can also use these techniques to get better regularization of the smaller data sets. So over here, we have a top full of M full MNIST, bottom quarter of MNIST. To the left, we have normal dropout, the way that you would use it in the field. To the right, we have uh, the Bayesian model with the Bayesian evaluation technique. You can see that already when we just have quarter of MNIST, just by just integrating over the top layer of parameters, the other parameters would just overfit. We can get better robustness by integrating over more parameters. We can also use these results to get state of the art without doing nothing whatsoever. So this is Cypher 10. Uh, it's another benchmarking data set where we have digits of 10 different classes. Uh, so we have, we have small images of different classes. We have cars and planes. And what I did over here was just take the state of the art of the time. Downloaded, I just downloaded the model from the internet and tested that at test time using, using the Bayesian evaluation techniques by just averaging stochastic passes. And that was the new state of the art when I published, when I put that online. I, if you can think of an easier way to get state of the art results, then let me know because over here I just did, basically did only that. It was a lot of mathematical derivations though. Um, some real world applications as well. So you can look at camera pose localization. In this setting, we have a picture, and we need to tell where that picture was taken from. For example, this picture of Fink's College was taken from this point facing this way. And these sort of systems are used in autonomous vehicles, for example. These sort of systems are used to get fine-grained localization of where you are. Uh, if you use GPS, when you only get localization up to 5, 10 meters, and these are used to get localization up to 5, 10 centimeters, this sort of information of where you are with respect to the junction in front of you, with respect to the edge of the sidewalk. And Kendall and Chipola managed to show 10 to 15 percent improvement using these techniques over the state of the art in the field. Now, 10 to 15 percent improvement over 10 centimeters where every centimeter counts. That's a very big improvement. So we saw why our models work. We can try to understand, we can try to use these ideas now to understand what our models know. But first of all, why should we even care about what our models know? Let's say I were to give you a bunch of pictures of dogs and ask you to build a dog breed classifier. And then I were to give you this to classify. What would you want your model to do? I don't know about you, but I wouldn't want my model to force this cat into a specific dog breed. I would want my model to say, I don't know. I've never seen anything like that before. It's outside of my data distribution. I'm not going to say what dog breed it belongs to. Now, this might sound like a contrived example, but similar situations appear again and again in decision making, in physics, in life sciences, in medicine. Imagine your physician using a model to diagnose a patient if they have cancer or not, make, to make a decision whether, uh, whether to start treatment. I wouldn't want um, whether to make a decision whether to start treatment or not. I wouldn't rely on a model that couldn't tell me whether it's actually certain about its prediction, about its output or not. Or if you're a practitioner, they can also make use of this sort of information. Yeah. For example, developing model debugging tools. 
the simplest thing that I can think of is just take your model, take the input that you expect your model to, to be used on, pass it through the model, and just see whether it's actually certain about its output. I think that's a bad sign if your model is uncertain about the stuff that it should be used for on a daily basis. Or you can build specialized models. You can have a quick and dirty model that works on most of the data, and only when it's uncertain, you use it for, you pass the data to a more specialized, more complex, expensive model. Or even critical systems, where not necessarily a nuclear power plant, but for example, algo trading, where you wouldn't want to rely on a model that says you should put $10 million on Apple stocks because I think they're going to increase by 5% by next month, without saying, yeah, but I'm actually not certain at all about this prediction. If you think about that, machine learning is used in practice when you make, when you use machine learning applications, you use it at the end of the day to make decisions. And when you make a decision, you need to know what your model knows and what your model doesn't know. So we need a way to tell what our models know and what they don't know. Luckily, like I said before, we fit a distribution. We already talked about the first moment. That, that's what we had before. But we can also look at the second moment, about the predictive uncertainty, which can simply can be evaluated by that. That's as simple as looking at the sample variance of stochastic forward passes through the model. Now, in more practical terms, you can, if you give me point x, in order to get uncertainty, all I need to do is just drop units at test time, do that for 10 times, and then just accumulate the sample variance. Or in Python, these five lines. This is the most practical way to get uncertainty in deep learning that I know of. Um, and that's just as simple as anyone that uses deep learning can just go back home and just implement that to see what does, it, what does the model that you're using knows and what it doesn't know. What does this uncertainty look like? Well, if you remember the example from the beginning of the talk, you gave me the CO2 levels in uh, Mauna Lua, Hawaii over the past 50 years. I normalized it and set that, and then I fitted the model. In this case, five layers, rectified, uni rectified linear units, uh, doing dropout the way that we do that today in the field. And you asked me, CO2 level in 20 years' time? I don't know, but my model says that. If you take the same model, the same structure, the same weights, and just look at the predictive mean, predictive variance, just change the testing technique, all of a sudden we see this. We see all of this information that we just threw away until now. We see that in 20 years' time, the model says, it might be this value, but actually I have no idea. If you ask what's going to be the value in one year's time, the model says it might be that, and I'm more certain about my prediction. We can actually see what this looks like online. Uh, PPB. While training. So over here we have in solid blue line, we have the predictive mean. In shaded blue, we have the predictive variance. And what we have over here, we're just doing a forward pass for the model stochastic forward pass using dropout, and then backward pass that we use to actually train the model. So this is actually training the model and accumulating the stochastic passes over time to look at what does the model learn over time, what does it look like. Uh, the black lines are actually the samples from the dropout network. And you can see that uncertainty increases far away from the data. It's smaller next to the data. And if we add some more data points, and restart the model, we can actually see that it will collapse uncertainty next to the new data. Uh, I have the code for that online. Um, uh, you can just go and play with that and see what you get for the stuff that is, I don't know if it's somehow related to the stuff that you work on. How good is this uncertainty estimate? I must say over here was quite I was quite surprised to see that, the, I was very surprised to see the results that I got here. I took a bunch of data sets and just took, just trained the dropout neural network the way that you would use it in the field, looked at the RMSE, compared that to other techniques, and you would expect you would get better RMSE because dropout is, has been developed empirically for a long time to get very good RMSE. I compared the test log likelihood an estimate of how good your uncertainty is to these, to these other models. So that's, these are the two models, 
techniques that we had in bold in the survey that I had before for the Bayesian neural networks. Uh, VI by Alex Graves and probabilistic backpropagation by Miguel and Ryan Adams. These were techniques that were developed specifically to do inference in Bayesian neural networks. And I was surprised to see that this naive approach of just taking samples through the dropout network, averaging them, and looking at the sample variance, you get better estimates for uncertainty. Yeah. Um, we can look at some real-world examples of using this uncertainty information. The first setting that I have is in deep reinforcement learning, which I think is quite cool. So over here we have a Roomba. Uh, it's a tiny vacuum that walks around on the floor, collecting dirt, bumping into walls. And we want to have a smart Roomba, a smart agent. Uh, this is the Roomba over here. It has eyes looking forward. Um, so we're going to penalize our agent, minus 5, for walking into a wall and give it a reward of plus 10 for collecting dirt. And our environment is stochastic and ever-changing. We have dirt appearing in random places, disappearing from other places. We have obstacles maybe moving in towards you. We want to train a network, an agent, to learn what actions to take in different situations. For that, we need to define a behavioral policy. In current research, you would use epsilon greedy, basically saying, take a random action with some probability, and otherwise take the optimal action. But if we know what we don't know, we can actually learn much, much faster. We can use, for example, Thomson sampling. Draw a realization from your current belief over the world, and then choose the action with the highest value, which, again, in practice, is as simple as just do dropout at test time, and then choose the action with the highest value. We can see what this looks like. Again, I have the code for that online. So over here we have in green, a greedy agent, and in blue, the Thomson agent. At the moment, they're just walking randomly, collecting information. Um, in a couple of seconds, we're going to start learning. This is time. This is average reward. If we're going to let that run for long enough, we're going to see something that looks like this. On average, and that's a stochastic process. Again, in green, epsilon greedy. In blue, Thompson something. We're going to see that Thompson something converges much, much faster. That's on log scale. Thompson something converges in within 30 iterations. Epsilon greedy takes hundreds of iterations to get to the same average reward. So that's one, I think, very nice application, speeding up reinforcement learning. Second application, again, by Kendall and Cipolla, is using the uncertainty information for image localization. So that's the example that we talked about before. And if you remember, we were talking about Bayesian confidence. So we can get uncertainty estimates out of these as well. And as you would expect, uncertainty, if you remember the example for the cat being outside of the data distribution for a bunch of dogs, you observe the same over here. As you, as you get your test photo, as you get your test image farther and farther away from the data distribution, uncertainty increases. For example, if you have strong occlusion, then you would have high uncertainty. And what's really cool about that is that, is that you have strong, very strong correlation between the uncertainty and the positional error, which means that you can go back over here. You can say, I'm an autonomous vehicle. I'm a self-driving car. And I have the high probability of think that I'm over here. But there is some probability that I'm actually over here. Now, you can imagine how important this information is when you need to change your speed, for example, and there's a person in front of you. Another application, again, uh, used for autonomous vehicles is image segmentation, basically scene understanding, trying to understand what's in a photo and where it is. So over here, for example, you can see, that's again by Kendall et al. You can see uh, there are people over here, and then we want to say these are people, that's a cyclist, cyclist, that's a road, that's a sidewalk. And again, we want to know what we don't know. And Kendall et al. managed to show that 
using similar techniques, using basically a Bayesian coordinate net again, that we can get very we can get that very important information. For example, over here, is that a person? The model is not known, is not that sure. So maybe I should still not run into that. Um, you can see that the edges of the sidewalk, for example, have higher uncertainty. So maybe as an autonomous vehicle, I should be more careful when I get next to that. One last application that I'm going to talk about is in bioinformatics, DNA methylation. So Anger Mueller and Stegel took a network and tried to predict DNA methylation. So DNA methylation, basically in this setting, we have small tiny molecules sitting on the DNA that basically regulate what genes are turned on, what genes are turned off. And they managed to, and basically Anger Mueller and Stegel looked at the methylation rate of different embryonic stem cells. They found that uncertainty increases in genomic contexts that are harder to predict. And that basically goes back to our example of a physician using information like this to, for example, prescribe a drug. So you can see that the physician would get information, hmm, my model is not certain about this prediction, so I'm going to take that into account when I make my decision. Or my model is very certain about that, so I'm going to make the de decision with higher confidence. So we talked about some cool applications of uh, understanding what our models don't know and understanding w how our models work. We can talk about what our models, why do our models predict this, not that, and other interesting open problems next. So basically, we can use this theory to answer, at least to attempt to answer, many more questions, like how can we build interpretable models? How can we combine Bayesian techniques and deep learning models? How can we make practical use of deep learning uncertainty in such models? Or how can we extend deep learning in, in principled ways? I don't think I need to convince you that we should care about, we should care about interpretable, interpretable models. I wouldn't trust a decision made by a black box. And there is such a huge research literature into interpretable Bayesian models. Why not combine them? We can combine them in principled ways now. Or extending on these ideas, if you ask many in deep learning, they would say the forefront of the field now would be unsupervised learning. And I think that what's better to base that on, if not Bayesian data analysis, a field that has been studied for more than 50 years? If you work in Bayesian modeling, then you can go beyond all of these simplifying assumptions that we used to make in the past, like if you work on sequences, back of words assumptions, if you work on image data, dimensional reduction, we can actually use regularities, we can exploit structure in the data using these complex models and pipeline them with Bayesian models in a principled mathematically rigorous way. What about practical implications of deep learning uncertainty? I think that's actually quite cool because, I mean, just a simple example of language ambiguity. <laughs> We cannot capture language ambiguity with these new age tools of deep learning. Basically, everyone in NLP, in language processing now, would be using deep learning models. And until now, there would be no way to even talk about how to capture language ambiguity. We can start looking at these interesting fundamental problems. I mean, ambiguity pervades all aspects of language understanding, from ambiguity in words and phrases to ambiguity in a user's uh, in user's decision in dialogue systems. Or using weight uncertainty for model debugging. So that's what I mentioned at the beginning of the talk. You can, for example, look at the magnitude of the weights over time. Or we can look at the output uncertainty, if the model is more certain about the output or not. And lastly, we can make principled extensions to deep learning uncertainty. What about doing dropout in recurrent networks? Um, for those of you that don't know, so these are networks that I used in most of language processing. We feed an input to an internal layer, get an output, and then get input for the next step. And repeat the same stuff again and the same unit again and again and again and again. We don't know how to do dropout in these today. If you ask people in the field, they would just say the dropout gets amplified over time. If you do that in the recurrent layers, and that basically drowns the signal, so we don't do the dropout. If you use this mathematical framework, then we do know how to do dropout. 
it is actually very easy by looking at the mathematics. So that, and also looking at new approximating distributions, which basically are equivalent to new stochastic regularization techniques. And for example, model compression, fitting a entire model on a mobile phone. All of these are currently basically projects that we have work in progress. Okay, so final words. I think that the theory above basically means that deep learning captures stochastic processes underlying our data. That means that we can use the vast Bayesian statistics literature with these models, and we can explain them by mathematically rigorous theories. It means that we can extend them in a principled way, and we can make practical use of models. Okay? <laughs> we can make practical use of Bayesian models, Bayesian techniques in this setting. <laughs> Lastly, that basically means that uh, we have uncertainty estimates built in, as we saw an example for that. But if you ask me, the most exciting part of this work is the my computer. Okay, sorry for that. <laughs> if you ask me, the most exciting part is the work to come. Practical uncertainty in deep learning applications. Principled extension. That's not my left. <laughs> Principled extensions to deep learning tools. Hybrid deep learning Bayesian models. That and much, much more. I think the next couple of years we're going to see very interesting research. Thank you very much for listening. Samples, does the norm decrease? Not the number of samples. If you increase the data set size that you train the model on. Right. Um, the answer for that would be also no. Um, this is one of the projects that we have as a master's project. Um, I think from the mathematics, that's basically what we expect to see. We haven't validated we haven't validated that empirically yet, and this basically that is a very interesting question to validate that. Yes. Obviously it would be nice not to have to run through the test computation ten times. Um, I presume that was the number you used for the MNIST as well? So ten X. Not necessarily, it depends very much on the model structure and on the data set. In practice, I would say that it's not that much of a concern for most tasks because you can, all of these models are implemented today on GPUs, on parallel hardware, and evaluating your model on the same image 10 times is the same as just loading a batch of the same image 10 times, passing that through the model, and then just averaging the results. It's so power, it's not the same power. Uh, time wise, it would be the same. Um, yeah, obviously, it would take. Come again? What number did you use for the MNIST results? For the MNIST results, I don't remember. It might have been, it was probably more than 10. I think it was either, I can tell you that for Cypher 10, I remember exactly how much it was. So for this experiment, blah. Yes. So for this experiment, the point, uh, actually one of the experiments that we did was look at the number of samples that you get over time. Uh, how, do, how does this improve the estimator? Because the MC dropout is a Monte Carlo, the Bayesian technique, the predictive mean, is a stochastic estimator. So it has some variance. So we looked at how, what the estimator mean and the, how much does it vary as we use more and more samples. To get these results, it, using 20 samples was enough to get a statistically significant improvement. As you use more and more samples, when you get uh, cleaner, basically you get less and less noisy estimates. I don't know for MNIST, it's in the paper. For this, it was 20. Yes? So you made a, a nice explicit connection between dropout and the variational objective. Um, but then there's also all the things we know about variational objectives, so that it's in, in, in this direction, it's, it's kind of a local approximation, right? And maybe for confidence, we also know that uh, many local minimas essentially qualitatively behave the very same way, so it doesn't probably matter that you 
miss many local minima with of variational approximation and instead precisely characterize one local local optima, but for other networks it may not be the case. So do you think there is some research to be done to rethink um, the kind of variational that's, approximation objective? I think that's a very interesting question. And I would say that from the other side, from the deep learning perspective, the fact that we know that we are doing a variational approximation means that we can design models in a different way. So we know so we get good estimates for predictive mean and good and get good estimates for the predictive variance. And these will not necessarily have the same structure as the models that perform best when you just do the, the job out approximation. So if you look at today the literature, you get lots of state-of-the-art results. Models that were fine-tuned by just, oh, I'm going to add another layer, I'm going to change the size of the pooling, blah, blah, blah. Um, you basically optimizing the model structure for the job out approximation results. And if you have a different technique at test time, then you're going to start experimenting with models to get maybe different model structures that would work well from the variational perspective. And just looking at that for the variational perspective gives us insights into what interesting model structures we might want to use. For example, um, not exactly talking about this, but talking about, mo for example, structured noise processes. Rather than just using dropout, you can use smarter noise processes that exploit data, exploit, exploit structure in your data. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah. I mean, um, people know that if they train the same model 10 times and then use an ensemble of the different models, right, which is computationally much more expensive than what you suggest, uh, that there's wide improved performance typically, right? So, so now the, the real benefit of what you, should, you propose is uh, that you only have to have one single training run, right? And so I, I wonder if there's maybe, if the, the, the naive ensemble approach is more closer to full Bayesian posterior inference and not so much affected by local approximation. I and think maybe if there's something in between yeah. that, but, but it's okay. I mean, it's like, uh, it's more of an open question. So, so I think uh, that's a very interesting question. Um, I haven't looked at comparing ensembles to just uh, using the dropout averaging as an output. I would say that's a very interesting experiment to do, mostly because if you look at language processing community, all the good results that they get, they just train 50 models on the same data, and then just average the results that they get from the 50 models. And I would hypothesize that you can either approximate that very well, or maybe even get the same results by just sampling from dropout at this time. I think that's something that is very interesting to look at. Behind you. <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I found this really interesting to see that connection between um, Bayesian inference and especially Bayesian approximate inference and all these tricks we use in neural networks. Um, something, as somebody who has never really used uh, Bayesian approximate inference, I was just wondering though, um, do people really understand why Bayesian approximate inference works? No, um, I don't understand why approximate inference works. I have lots of questions about that, but as a first year student, I was very happy to accept that. Now, I, I, if you were to ask me, I have so many questions about, I don't understand why that makes any sense whatsoever, but that's a topic for another discussion. So, so, uh, so beyond drawing inspiration from Bayesian approximate inference methods and translating them to neural networks, do we really understand what's going on now? We understand that much better than what we understand in deep learning, because this has been studied from the, from the mathematical perspective for a long time, and we understand many of the properties that we, of the tools that we use, and you understand why we use them. Um, so I think, yes, I mean, you can definitely in, make an induction step from what we know about Bayesian inference, approximate version inference specifically, into deep learning. Yeah. Uh, Sebastian asked a question about the zeros in your KL divergence. Oh, yeah. And yeah. you promised an awesome answer. <laughs> I, I, I promised a very long answer. Um, so technically, this equation, let's find it. I want even this equation, yeah. Technically, this equation makes no sense. If you look at that from the mathematical perspective, we have a discrete distribution. We're looking at the KL between the discrete distribution and the continuous distribution. Bernoulli is not absolutely continuous with respect to the normal distribution. So this is actually minus infinity. In order to make sense of this, um, what you can do, you can, for example, do what we do in zero temperature EM. You can look at Q, which is a bunch of Bernoulli's, as a mixture of two very thin Gaussians. 
very narrow Gaussians, very small standard deviation, one fixed at zero and one fixed at, well, one or m if you want to. And then you can actually capture, and then you can calculate this KL. And then that basically just going to give you a constant penalization term. And if you were to actually sit down and implement that on a computer, you will just be sampling from Bernoulli because that decay is very, very quickly to zero. So if you were to sample from a normal distribution with a standard deviation 10 to the minus 30, then in all practical implementations, you're going to sample from, uh, well, zero. So if you're going to sample from a mixture of two, Ga two Gaussians with that tiny standard deviation, one at zero, one at one, in practical terms, you're going to sample from Bernoulli on a computer implementation. In mathematical terms, that's just going to be this KL minus a constant term, which is like 60 or something like that. So it's not even a big constant term. And that actually, that actually leads to my objections of why version inference doesn't make too much sense. But again, that's going to be too long to discuss. <laughs>